Hi there. Today I'd like to share with you an Esperanto soliloquy from Act 3, Scene 1 of Hamleto, Regido de Danuyo. Chu esti ab ne esti. Tia staras nun la demando. Chu pli noble estas el porti chiwin patoin, chiwin sagoin de la colera sorto, au sin armi contra la tutta maro da misero e cae per la contrastaro ilin fini. For morti, dormi, cae ne nio plu. Cae scii che lo dormo tutte finis doloron de la coro, la mil battoin heredon de la corpo, tio este tre desirinda celo, morti, dormi, tranquille dormi. Yes, sed ancau, sonji, Yen estes laborido. Chiai sonjoi visiti povas nian mortan dormon post la forgetto de la terrae sorgoi. Yen tio nin haltigas, tio faras che la miseroi terrae longe dauras. Alie, chiu volus el portadi la mocon ca la battoin de la tempo, la premon del potenzae, la offendoin de la fierae, Falson de la iugioi tormentoin de la amo rifusita, la melestimon, ciun sen induloi regalas al marito effectiva, ies ciu volus tion ciel porti. Se mem, per unu puscio de ponardo, li povu sin el cio liberigi. Ca ciu do in svito, ca in gemoi, la sciargion de la vivo volus porti, se ne la tim, De io post la morto, de tiu ne conata land el chiu ne niu plu revenas, cae pro tiu pli volas ni al porti cion terran, ol flugi al miseroi ne conatae. La conscienzo faras nin timuloi, alla colora hela de decido aligas la palezzo del pensado, cae plei coragia forta entrepreno, per tio causo ne haltas sen decide, cae cio restas penso, sed ne faro. Several Esperanto translations of Hamlet have been made over the years. At the moment, I believe nine of them have been published. But this one, the first, made in 1894 by Zamenhof himself, is especially important for two reasons. First of all, this text proved to the world at large that Esperanto was a fully-fledged language. This wasn't just some quirky party trick like speaking Pig Latin. No, this language was capable of handling Shakespeare's largest and most famous play. It could handle anything you threw at it. Second of all, within the Esperanto community, it proved that Esperanto was good to go as is. Many of its members were discussing at the time, debating and advocating for changes to be made. Well, we should add an indefinite pronoun, I think. Wait a second, why do adjectives and nouns have to match up? That's just going to get in our way if you have to write a poem with this. All of these theoretical obstacles, Zamenhof obviously overcame and produced this beautiful, performable, and understandable work of literature. Let me explain those three. Beautiful. Shakespeare retained the beauty of uh, alliteration, for example. Uh, in English, it goes, he could make his quietus with a bare bodkin, right? a unsheathed sword. Someone could kill themselves. In Esperanto, it says, per unu pusho de ponardo. With one push of the poignard, he could kill himself. Hmm, it's still there. Obviously, a poignard and a bodkin, very different, but the feeling is still the same, and the fun of that alliteration still remains. Performable. Okay. Shakespeare, Zamenhof, could have written this text in a number of ways. He could have rearranged the word order and accidentally created a number of tongue twisters that might look good on paper, but when someone gets up to perform it, they jumble everything up. Well, as you just heard, um, the text is relatively easy to say uh, in a performance situation and people can understand it. Understanding it, 
it was interesting to me uh, that some lines were more easy to understand in Esperanto than in English. I've performed in about a dozen uh, Shakespeare plays over the years, so I'm no stranger to Elizabethan English, and yet I understood lines suddenly that I hadn't fully understood uh, until now, just reading over and memorizing this text. I'll give you two examples. Uh, in, in English, it goes, to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take... I'm sorry. Outrageous fortune. What does that, what does that mean? Outrageous fortune. Are you, is that like complaining, oh man, winning the lottery, that's got to be tough because you got all that paperwork to deal with. It's an outrageous fortune that I have to deal with. Oh, yeah, boo-hoo, buddy. Well, that's not... Maybe nowadays you hear outrageous fortune, you'd think that, but it literally is saying an outrage, an outrageous fortune or fate, the angry fate. Oh, okay, your lot in life, that might not be so good. Where in Esperanto it says, la colera sorto, the angry fate or... Uh, fortune. Okay, yeah, I get that. I'm not confused at all by a modern connotation of that adjective and noun. Very helpful. Okay. Um, another example. Um, it says to die, to sleep no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand... I'm sorry, wait, wait, wait. You, you said to die, to sleep no more. Uh, so if you're sleeping no more, that means you're like permanently awake. Is that what you're saying? But then you say, and, and by way of that sleep, you're going to do all this, but you're not sleeping, I thought. Didn't you say you're not sleeping anymore? Well, okay. In Esperanto, it says, for morti, dormi, kaine mio plu. Oh, I see. To die, to sleep, and nothing more. You're saying to only sleep. That's all. And that is your release. Okay. You're not saying to not sleep anymore. Very helpful. I got gotcha. you. Continue, please. So you see where the way that Esperanto is written, there's no Elizabethan Esperanto compared to a modern Esperanto that you have to understand both to get where they're coming from like you do in English. Like, well, back then that would have meant this. Nope, there's only one Esperanto. So if someone in China or India or Pakistan were to learn Esperanto, they would understand that soliloquy from the get-go. They wouldn't need a No Fear Shakespeare or some other uh, internet help to get them through the, the play. So. There are some examples of the beauty of this text, and now you know also how it sounds. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.